Good morning, and thank you for joining us for our live stream video service coming straight from Charleston Calvary Church of the Nazarene on Red Bank Road in Goose Reef. We're so glad you've joined us this morning, and I know you're in for a blessing. I pray that you've had a wonderful week using the Lord's blessings as your shield and your protector. And we do want to thank you for your faithfulness. All of you have been faithful in your giving during this time of pandemic. And if you would like to continue to give, you may do so via our easy tithe, or you can mail in your offering post office box 329, Goose Creek, South Carolina, or you can drop it by the church. And I know that God will bless you for honoring and honor you for your giving. Join with us now as we worship the Lord in song.
And I don't have my mic on. I'm Karen Lawson, the associate pastor, and our pastor Lindsay is away this weekend. And I will be bringing the word to you this morning. And so I just hope that um, this second chapter of Second Timothy will feed your soul and, and lead and guide you as much as it has been me. I've been studying Second Timothy for a while now. I think... A month ago when I filled the pulpit, 
I was on chapter 1, and today we are in chapter 2. It continues with um, a letter to Timothy from Paul. Paul is in prison when he's writing these letters. Timothy um, is in Ephesus working um, in a church there. He's a young minister, and um, Paul is encouraging him to be faithful in his Christian life, in his ministry, in, a, in his personal relationship with God. And during these times, it's almost as if we were reading about our times today when, when you read how it's described um, as difficult times, extremely difficult times when things were seeming out of whack and there were false teachers and there were many things going on in the society then of lack of loyalty to the military, lack of loyalty to government. Socially and spiritually, um, morally, difficult, difficult times. So as we're reading through Second Timothy, I like to act, and I would like you to act, to listen as if the letter is actually written to you. Because it is very much... A part of our times is very much, um, it's just so relevant as to what is going on with us. Second Timothy chapter 2. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses to entrust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. Endure hardship like a good soldier of Christ. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. Sim similarly, which I cannot say, just here it is, likewise. If anyone competes as an athlete, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive the share of the crops. Reflect on what I'm saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all of this. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel, for which I am suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Here is a trustworthy saying, if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. If we are faithless, he will remain faithful, for he cannot disown himself. Keep reminding them of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is of no value and only ruins those who listen. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman of one who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hermenius and Philetus who were wandered away from the truth. They say that the resurrection has already taken place, and they destroy the faith of some. Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with the inscription, The Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. In a large house there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for noble purposes, and some for ignoble. If a man cleanses himself from the latter, he will be an instrument for noble purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. Flee from the evil desires of your youth. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments, because you know they produce quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Those who oppose him, he must gently instruct. 
in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to the knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. When I read that, I hear three things, or I broke the chapter up into three things that I think we can make useful in our Christian life. That we are to, as servants of Christ, be honorable, be useful, and be ready. <coughs> as we look at verse 3, he tells us, he uses the example of a soldier. And then he tell, it goes on in verse 4, he says, He does not get entangled in any civilian affairs, but lives to please his commanding officer, Jesus Christ. While I'm sure he's very aware, we are all very aware of civil affairs, of the discontentment in our country and in so many things in our lives. But we must not become so involved in that. That must not be how we weigh our decisions, our actions, our attitudes, the things that we would do. Because we must focus on what our commanding officer is, good soldiers, what Jesus Christ would have us to do. Focus on the things of him. I was very um, surprised, thrilled, because as I had been studying this, um, early in the week, my cousin, uh, Michael Davis, posted on his Facebook about an NBA player who plays for Orlando Ma Magic. And I don't, I always get his name wrong because he has two first names. I really don't remember if his name is Isaac Jonathan or Jonathan Isaac. <laughs> Either way, the important thing about him, more than his name, more than the fact that he's an NBA player, more than the fact that he is an ordained minister, is the way he lives out his life. This week, he was the only one on both teams in the NBA, and I, I think they were playing the Phoenix Suns, I don't know. Um, the main thing is that did not kneel for the national anthem and did not wear a Black Lives Matter shirt. He just stood reverently. He did nothing to purposely draw any attention to himself, but it made a big hoop to do in the media. And a, a reporter, I'm sure more than one, stayed after the game and said to him, do black lives not matter to you? He himself being an African-American man. And this is a quote from the article, and it just blessed me to death. Because of the stand he took, because I think he has the um, eye of the nation more than so many people, because so many people that it can reach for the glory of God but also the gentle way that he explained, very non con non con not wanting to start an argument. Con I can't say it. Sorry, I don't have words this morning. He just did not. It was about his personal beliefs and what he was doing and nothing else. But it spoke so well. Not argumentative. Not opposing anyone. Strictly standing for his beliefs. He said, I felt like I just wanted to take a stand on it. I feel like we all make mistakes, but I think the gospel of Jesus Christ is that there's grace for us and that Jesus came and died for our sins and that we will all come to an understanding of that and, that, and understanding that God wants to have a relationship with us, that we can get past skin color, we can get past all the things in our world that are messed up, that are jacked up, Isaac continued. I think when you look around, racism isn't the only thing that afflicts our society, that plagues our nation, that plagues our world. I feel like coming together on this message that we want to get past not only racism, but everything that plagues us as a society. And I feel like the answer to that is the gospel. And earlier in the article, he had said, my whole life I have been served by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And of course, I do believe that black lives matter. 
I believe that all lives matter, but that he looks at everything through the perspective of what would his Lord and Savior, who died for us, how does he look on this? And that everything is measured for that, and that that is what he takes a stand on. He had also, the article had started out saying that he had spoken with his coaches, with the owners and management of Orlando Magic, and with his teammates to explain his heart and his life and why he, why he wasn't donning that shirt and why he wasn't kneeling during the national anthem. That it was no offense to anyone. It wasn't that he didn't care about injustices, but that he was standing for the gospel of Jesus Christ and who he was, and that's how he measured everything. And I thought, what better, more current example could we have of a good soldier of Jesus Christ whose interest is in pleasing his commanding officer. He goes on to say, it goes on to say in um, 2 Timothy to explain that an athlete who wants to be a victor, which says to me there are a lot of people who might be running the race, who might be doing the same thing, but if you want to win it, if you want to wear the crown, which we know in the original Olympic Games people were, were crowned, um, but we are looking for the crown of righteousness that you do so according to the rules, which doesn't say what society expects of you, how man measures you, but according to the rules, what the Word of God, what, what God Almighty Himself requires of us. There's someone who's going to put in all this effort to be a good soldier, to be an athlete, that's not some hobby. That's not something they do on the sidelines. That is their identity. And it costs them pain, time. It's everything that they are. It's their one goal. And they make themselves aware of what the judge is looking for and what's required of me. 24-7, 365, eat, breathe, sleep. And it's not all pain. It's your identity. It's what you revel in. It's where your hope and your strength and your praise comes from. And that's what Paul is saying to us. And then he says in verse 6, a hardworking farmer should get the first of the crops. And that seems kind of odd because you're like, well, they're his. Because we have the mindset of American farming or farming in the world today the majority of farms are owned by that farmer, so of course he's going to have the crops for his household. They belong to him. But back in this day, we need to sort of think of it like when we see in movies or read in history about the Middle Age serves, how the landowners, they lived in town. And a lot of times a business or a temple would own the land. And a servant a serf, someone was tied to the land because the person who owned it controlled them and where they were to live and what their identity was. So he says the farmer should get the first crops because he is out doing hard work. He is not someone who owned the land. He's not someone who put up the money for the seeds or the whatever. But still, because he is out there putting in the pain, he is to be the one who gets that. He is, and it's what's required of us in all these examples. Because we're the ones putting in the physical work, the devotion, the focus. What the farm was going to actually produce depended on the one doing this work. And that's how it is for us in our Christian lives. If we are going to represent Jesus Christ the way that he should be represented, it depends on our devotion, our attitude, our mindset, our physical work, what we do with our time, our money, our hands, our mouth, what we feed our brain and our hearts on. That great example continues through Jesus Christ, through Paul, through people today. But we need to get back 
further on into Timothy, back to the three things that I had told you that I hear. I hear that we are to be honorable, focused in skilled teaching, living the word in honesty, not twisting it as to what would make it nice and fluffy and sweet to people who want to hear it, or the ones of us who seem to only need Jesus when something horrible is going on, or we need a miracle, which is just a point to start building and growing because there's so much more to him and so much required from him. But we are to present the word of God in our lives, in our mouth, in our relationships, exactly the way that it is written, what Jesus requires and not what is just easy for us to say. We are to be workers that are approved of him. Avoid quarrels about words, things that have no value, and it only ruins those who listen or read if you're a Facebook avid person. We are to represent Jesus Christ. We are to be looking at everything through the eyes of Christ Jesus. Not just what we say or hear, but what we type, what we thumbs up or thumbs down to or angry face or smiley or heart to. We are still to be representatives of Jesus Christ focused on the truth of the gospel. <clears throat> because the gospel of Jesus Christ, all, in the gospel of Jesus Christ, all wrongs will be righted. If we are out there not quarreling, but loving and serving and accepting people in our lives that need to know the gospel, and choosing to invest in them, all wrongs will be righted. We, we don't have to defend our opinions, who we vote for, who we don't vote for. We don't even have to actually comment on everything that is going on in this society. But we are to stand up and testify who Jesus Christ is to us and that he loves all and that he forgives all. <coughs> the more we focus on quarreling and the things that are not of God, the godless chatter, the further away from God we become. And in the process, we destroy others. Especially if we have chosen to wear the name Christian loud and proud because that is inviting people to look at us, to say, if you watch me, if you follow my life, you will learn more of who Jesus Christ is and what he has for you. And if we are caught up in all this quarreling, then we lead them astray as we go astray. God's solid foundation reminds us of two things. It's sort of a, it's a two-sided seal. On the first side, it reminds us that God knows those who are his. He knows us inside and out. He knows where we are. He knows our thoughts. He knows <clears throat> what we need to do. And he knows the intent of our heart. And that is so comforting. But on the other side of that coin is we're reminded <clears throat> that it's our responsibility in this relationship Everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from evil. That's all described for you in verse 19. We are to be honorable and protect our witness. We are to choose to find the way that God views things and what he requires of us and do the same. So we're to be honorable, but we are also to be useful Verse 20 reminds us that there's diversity in every house, in, in, in the family of God even. That there are gold and silver and clay or wood, clay and wood. Some things are noble 
and some things are not. Some are valuable for us to be used of God. And some are just sort of dust collectors and in the way. If we want to be useful, we have to choose to be made holy by putting away anything unclean, taking it from our lives so that we're not dust collectors in the house of God, but that we are useful, that we are prepared, that we are devoted to serving the purpose that he has created us for and that we are useful to the kingdom. To be useful to the master, we must cleanse ourselves from turning away from wickedness, and we're made holy in doing that. And the third thing that I hear in this letter is that he is telling me to be prepared or stay woke, as I keep trying to tell my kids. Stay woke. You were raised in the church. You know the scripture. You have it in your homes. Use it. When you see all the things changing and you feel so like you must comment, or more than commenting, taking a side and being passionate for that, that's not always a terrible thing. But more than that, be that soldier, be that athlete, be that servant that chooses to see things the way our master sees those things. Realizing that under the gospel, all wrongs are righted, all people are equal. Our whole purpose is for people to not lose their souls and to know the person of Jesus Christ. Another thing that I keep hearing um, on Way FM that I love, people hear so much from, so many times I should say, not they hear so much, So many times a baby Christian or those who are trying to seek whether this is truth, if this is life, that they haven't known who Christ is, they think the whole point of accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior is to avoid hell. And I've told you all before, it's not a deterrent. (laughs) It's a great selling point. Avoiding hell is part of the goal here. But Jesus Christ did not come and die for us so that we can get to heaven and then him get to know us. He died for us so that he knows us now. So that we can be in relationship with God our whole life and deepen and deepen this relationship. So that we are being the servant, the athlete, the soldier, the person that we should be and that we're bringing in crops for the kingdom. So we are to be prepared to do any good work. We've already covered that we need it to do that by living truth in the Word of God. That's how you prepare. You can't live in truth of the Word of God if you don't know the Word of God, if you're not spending time in the Word of God, if you're not spending time in prayer, if you're not learning how to hear Him how to know his direction and what he would have you to do. Verse 22 tells us to flee from the evil desires and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. And along with those who, and do it along with those who call out of a pure heart. In other words, hang with the saints. And you think, I don't know saints. Saints are perfect people. No. Saints are people who have pure hearts, who long for nothing more than to represent Jesus Christ the way he should be and to bring him glory and honor and praise from their mouth, from the way they live, in their relationships, and investing in others so that they can come to know who Jesus Christ are. And he tells us, and I love that it says this, I think, because I'm a blunt person and because I wasn't allowed to say stupid when I was little. But he says, stay out of stupid arguments. How many times have you got caught up in something and then you just have to stop yourself and think, what does this matter? Why am I passionate about this? Why am I emotional about this? Why am I causing division or arguing with another child of God 
another person created in God's image over something this frivolous. But it says, stay out of stupid arguments because they only produce quarrels and division. Be kind to everyone, everyone, able to teach. You can't teach what you don't know. If someone opposes you, gently instruct them. To me, that means be in relationship with them enough to be able to say something to them kindly. Can I show you why I believe this? Can I show you why I feel like this is hurting you? And have the scripture to show them. Out of love. Just say, this is why I believe this. And I love you. And I know Jesus wants the best for your life. I've maybe had two people in my life say to me, no, don't show me. But usually a person will say, okay, you know, I'm willing. I'm willing to hear why you believe that. And then the Bible tells us, gently instruct them in hope that God, God himself, your part's done there. You're being kind. You're gently instructing. You're befriending them. But your job is done there in hopes that God will lead them to truth and repentance so that they will come to their senses and escape the trap of the devil. That's the other reason you share scripture or share your heart with someone about their lives. It's not to build yourself up. It's not to prove you know more or anything like that. The only time we do that is because we love them. Be kind to everyone. And we do not want them to miss heaven and the precious relationship we have with Jesus now. And I just can't help but think during this, this quarantine and all the crazy things in the media, and it doesn't seem to matter what subject it is, there seems to be 50 different truths reported daily on any subject. And the world seems upside down, and I think it can leave us feeling like, like we're powerless, like we're useless. And I don't really dare to think that you remember my preaching so much a month ago as I want to point you back to 1 Timothy chapter 1, and I should have looked up the verse before to make sure I was telling you the truth. 1-7, for God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power and love and self-control. And that is how we can be bold in the gospel. Because when we don't think we have it in us, he's going to give us the strength to do it. The Holy Spirit is here to lead and guide and strengthen us to do that. Remember that we're not powerless or useless, even though it, it seems so many times that we live in a godless world. Or maybe the We've dropped into the sin of complacencies creeping in. Maybe we're overwhelmed. Maybe we just need to reboot and, and realize that if God calls us to do something, if he requires something of us, if he encourages it of us, like this second chapter of Timothy, to be honorable, no matter what. The whole, you know, who are you on the inside? Who are you when no one's looking? To be honorable to be useful, to be ready and prepared in this situation. The sin of complacency might be just creeping in or maybe we feel like we just need a reboot or rededication, just that encouragement. Turn to Psalms 51, 10 through 13, and this is how you do it. Here's where you get your start to give yourself that soul check. Am I an honorable soldier of Christ? Am I useful? Am I ready? Psalms 51.10 Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. We have to remember that none of us 
earned heaven or deserve heaven or ever could, but it's the grace of Jesus Christ and his dying on the cross. And we are those soldiers who have chosen to wear his name and his uniform. And he will create in us a new heart. He will restore our salvation back to us. Try to think back to remember the awe that your commanding officer, that the very Son of God chose to die for you. And how exciting it is and how clean and how refreshed when you receive that salvation. And share it with other people. No matter what is going on in this world and how topsy-turvy the seasons change, the seasons are not acting like their seasons, no matter the storms that are coming, COVID, quarantines, nothing that's going on changes who Christ is, what he did for us, or what he requires of us. Shall we pray? Bless the Lord, as we go throughout this week, I ask that you would bring your word to the hearts and minds of those who need it, who need encouragement or those who need correction or those to whom it is brand new and that we would choose to willingly accept what you have for us and that you would continue to sustain us. We love you and we praise you in your precious holy name. Amen.